Chapter 60 2011 He knew that one day he had to return, but after ten years he still couldn't bring himself to fly back. He'd managed fine by not going back to New York, despite the many work commitments that would have ordinarily taken him there. It had taken a long time for Steve to find peace, but that had never extended to accepting the hospitality offered by either Mrs Shahid or Star, and since Star had remarried, the invitations to visit dried up. It no longer seemed appropriate. Quietly, he was relieved that he no longer needed to make the choice. He made sure that the bands under his charge were given the opportunity to go stateside, where they were looked after by the ever-reliable Devon and his growing team of capable acolytes. He trawled out the occasional joke to those who didn't know his history that he boycotted New York for cultural reasons, but there could be no replacement for Jared. Devon was reliable and diligent, but he didn't have Jared's flair or personality, and they'd never bonded in the way he hoped they would. He knew it was his barriers that were up more than anything Devon had done, and it was hard to bond with someone you did everything you could to avoid seeing in person. However thick his skin had grown, he could never get to a point where a day could pass without some form of vivid recollection of 9-11. That meant he would never return. He felt as though he would never really recover. Steve had gone ten years without telling anybody else the details of that ghastly day. Tina had asked, Greta had demanded and his daughter, now a beautiful teenager, had tried to find out where the darkness had come from. Steve couldn't open the darkest corners of his soul to anybody. He spent years in therapy but he just wouldn't, or was it that he couldn't open up? The first hypnotist couldn't even get him under and the therapists were frustrated that their attempts to help him seemed so futile. No one fully knew the extent of how 9-11 had emotionally dumped him on his ass. Although ten years had passed, Isla remained the only recipient of the full, gruesome picture which his mind continued to paint. Steve didn't want to be helped. He didn't believe he deserved saving. Occasionally, he sent messages to Jared, although Star had gently asked Steve to stop with the messages. She said that every time the phone bleeped, a wave of optimism came across her before she was hit by the same realisation each time that they were both chasing the same impossible thing. Steve tried to stop, but a nasty habit had formed where he called his friend when drunk in the early hours of the morning. After the first few times, Star would ignore the call and allow Steve the opportunity to tearfully rant into the replacement phone she got. But after a while, the number was disconnected. Steve went back to texting and the service provider always sent him the same error message. At least two-way communication was resumed in a small way. Jared never came home from work that day. Star eventually moved on and Steve, comforted by the updates from the New York team that Star was being cared for, removed himself from her life. He continued to send his messages to a nonsense number that didn't even exist, rationalising that the other was as good a place to contact his friend as anywhere else. The messages weren't desperate anymore and were a friendly update on life from one mate to another. He just couldn't give up talking to his friend. His internal torture continued. The loss of Jared, the death of Irfan, the way he had treated Isla. All these things weighed him down with guilt. The immovable shit continued to rip at his core. Steve chose to bury himself in anything that took his mind away from himself. The bands rolled around the world with familiar rates of success. The internet and digital comms opened the global market. He was still ahead of the game, moving the business into new regions which no longer had the historic accessibility barriers such as proximity. But it was tougher. There was more competition, less money to play with and a tougher landscape to navigate. Regardless of the 20 year reputation Steve now had. Predictably, his home life never improved and it was Greta who finally called time on their partnership, not Stee. She had tried her best, but life was too short to be miserable. For the year following 9-11, she loyally stuck by him and absorbed his frustrations. The psychotherapy failed to release the demons and the darkness, creating the images tortured them all in the form of his often relentless screaming which would wake them most nights. She would hold him and give him her body as release, but it killed the little of them that had survived. They put aside what happened before Steve flew to New York. They put their incompatibility aside because Steve was in no shape to be on his own. And for the good of their daughter, they vowed to do whatever it would take to hold him together. Amy grew up not knowing the issues troubling her dad. She had a vague recollection of their late night phone call when he was in America, but never appreciated what 9-11 was until asking him to help her with a school project years later. It was this straw that broke Steve's emotional backbone. He was so angry and flew into a rage when she asked him to be a part of a classroom show and tell. Her mum explained a little, but she didn't know why he screamed at night. Inevitably, the domestic side of Steve's world returned to the same wretchedness that had all but broken their family unit before it happened, after which it was only a matter of time. His colleagues accepted that the Steve they had known was no more. 
They hoped it was a temporary thing and that one day things would get back to normal, but the years passed and those colleagues moved on to be replaced by new ones. The more youthful office was less tolerant of the moody, unresponsive boss who often went days without talking to anybody. Steve was a changed man. They never knew the Steve Lewis before the loss of Jared and the events of that September day, the time when Steve was first in the office, loudly playing the new pre-releases he'd been sent. Now he was drawn towards the dark 80s sounds of Joy Division and The Damned, sounds which pumped on an endless loop through his headphones as he stared blankly through the office. Whilst occasionally snapping himself into a more positive place, he would search for a more innocent sound, turning to the self-tape recordings of him and Ben messing around as teenagers in Ben's cellar. Steve Lewis was a mess, and Steve knew everybody knew, but he couldn't care less. He took to the road as much as he could justify. He started to see his domestic life as a series of trial separations interrupted by occasional periods of being together, usually around Christmas when the bands didn't tour. Being at home with his daughter was where a father should be, but Steve rarely was. When there was no work to take him away, he'd disappear, hiding out with Ben's family miles away from his own. Ben had stayed in touch with Johnny, their childhood friends, an intoxicated drummer from way back when. These were connections to a happier past which helped Steve retain the smallest level of sanity. There can be no hiding it from people who have known you all your life. Apart from the sympathetic noises that Greta had made in the immediate aftermath of the disaster, she had withdrawn. She would returned to being someone who was no more than a stranger to him, but he had managed to keep close to Amy and she to him. Technology helped and it was by no means perfect, but of all the things that had dissipated, their bond was true. Steve sat alone in front of the television to watch the 10-year anniversary service at Ground Zero. He was living alone, still in Islington and around the corner from his teenage daughter. The eventual split from Greta was amicable enough to the extent that they could publicly describe themselves as good friends without truly meaning it. While they had never been good friends, it was simpler and kinder than the truth. Greta was absolved of her responsibility to look after the man she'd spent too many years with, now happy to leave Amy in charge. Amy may have been his daughter, but theirs was different to the typical parent-child relationship because, without Amy, Steve was alone. It was almost an inverse relationship to the one it should have been. Steve meant it when he apologised for his up-and-down behaviour. He didn't want to be the surly, volatile man, but he was a distant character and often short-tempered and unkind. His deepest regret was reserved for the way he treated Isla. He didn't regret deciding to not go after her when he got back to England. Apart from being ashamed of his behaviour, he was not the person who could love her the way Isla Kylie deserved to be loved. However, he regretted what might have been. Aside from his daughter, she was the only light that shone into his soul. This morning, Sunday Observer carried a flattering piece about his 20 years in the industry. The article was accompanied by quotes from musicians and bands who offered their glowing tributes to his gravitas. The quotes from bands he had worked with in the early days were more about the person they remembered Steve to have been. The few commenting on his recent achievements were accompanied by words reflecting his diligent professionalism and success. Although this was just another article and these were just words on a page, Steve could read and easily understood their hidden meaning. He didn't bother reading the full copy. If it hadn't come out today, it might have meant more. Today was more significant than any other article about him.